All right, you know, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show a lot of images in this talk. I'm Richard Ruth. I teach uh, Southeast Asian history in the history department. My specialties actually are Thailand and Vietnam. Uh, but what I'm going to do is to give a talk that has a lot of images in it. And I'll try to explain why I'm going to use images as we go along. And some of it has to do with the age that we live in and how that differs from the past and how we rely so much more on uh, processing images and, and how that differs from Thailand's history uh, and how images were passed around. And the other reason I'm going to do it is I, I've just been collecting these. This is the wonderful thing about living in this digital age is so much of these images come across. This is on Thailand and political violence in, in Bangkok. Sorry. Okay, well, you're welcome to join us. Maybe across the hall. Sure. Um, they looked a lot sort of more genteel, I think, uh, than we do. But um, so, yeah, a lot of it will be image driven. And I know now, even especially in the military, I should say, there's a lot said about uh, death by PowerPoint and, and using too much PowerPoint. And I think I'm going to use a maximum of images and I hope a minimum of kind of bullet point PowerPoint stuff. And let's see if this works. Uh, first, let's start with images here. Uh oh. OK. These are, this is what I was thinking about, that uh, even if we don't always have time to read the newspapers, a lot of you guys saw this stuff uh, and asked me about it. What does it mean, uh, the fighting that went on between, it went on roughly from March uh, through April and to the end of May. And it was scenes like this of <coughs> men in motorcycle helmets with, uh, these are M80s uh, in his hand. He's firing these, these, these uh, powerful fireworks uh, across lines here. This is them setting uh, fire to the city at the uh, very end or trying to burn their camp encampments with kerosene and, and tires and that kind of thing. Strange weapons and, and slogans here in uh, foreign languages. This says, uh, we won't accept corruption uh, on his shirt here. Slingshots and, and machetes and also awful images like this. And I'll say this too now, some of these images are going to be difficult to look at. They're going to be a little bit gruesome. And that's part of this, this, this talk as well, too, and the nature of this political violence. I'm teaching a Thai history class now that looks at modern Thailand's history. It looks at roughly 1767 all the way up into the present. And I've seen some of my students here. They can tell you we've already talked about riots and protests in the 19th century in Thailand. A lot of these were Chinese riots uh, between secret society members and, and the danger of uh, locking Bangkok down or, or freezing Bangkok's uh, commercial activity because of protests from various factions of, of Chinese immigrants who were working in the ports. And I think at times the idea of political violence and, and violent protest is at odds with the popular image of Thailand and its history. Uh, many people imagine a lot of things. In fact, we could treat it like a class. What do you guys think of when we say Thailand? Maybe you do, Mr. Monty. rural areas and you see, right, the farms and the, the rice fields. We think of the beaches for people who go there for holidays on the beaches. You think of the temples and the orange clad monks. We also think of the red light districts that Bangkok's notorious for its uh, 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 a draw for the international sex trade and that kind of thing. We don't necessarily always think of uh, violence and protest. We usually associate that with Vietnam or Burma or some of the, even Indonesia, other countries in Southeast Asia. But it is very much part of Thailand's uh, past. It's very much part of its history. I mean, this is ba he's trying to throw a Molotov cocktail here and ended up uh, spilling some of the contents on himself. But in addition to the 19th century protests, there are political protests throughout Thailand's modern history. The most famous <coughs> ones, at least in my lifetime, happened in 1973 as the first uh, important one, where, where these are uh, pro-democracy student activists who are downtown. I'll show you a map in a second. And they're protesting against an authoritarian uh, government that was constitutionless. It was run by a field marshal. And uh, they ultimately, uh, the military was called in to disperse them and ended up kind of bottling them in and crowding them in and uh, shooting some of them. And they were ultimately saved in this episode by the king of Thailand, strangely enough, because the area that downtown they were in borders his palace. He ordered his guards to open the gates and allow the students to take refuge literally on the grounds of the palace. Uh, I forget now the numbers. A few dozen killed, 
but uh, he diffused the situation. The prime minister, who was a dictator at the time, uh, Tanom Kitty Gaton fled the country, and uh, for at least three years they had experiments with democracy. And the images I'm showing you are pretty much the only images you ever see from this period. You see them on the uh, uh, monument to the Constitution. Uh, this is actually a monument to overthrowing the absolute monarchy and the, uh, the development of a constitutional monarchy. This is the Constitution up there. And then three, after kind of three years of, of experimenting with expanded democracy, there was a kind of rightist backlash. And if you think about the years that this is set in, but we go from, May, I'm sorry, October 73 to October 76, if you draw a line right in the middle of it, what is that? Uh, or halfway between that period is, is April of, of 75. This is the fall of uh, Saigon. Is that right? And roughly in between the two of them. <coughs> and the sort of success of the communists in Cambodia and Vietnam. And they're in Thailand a kind of backlash against these student demonstrators. And uh, you ended up with another period of protests and violence with the students themselves being killed. In fact, this is one of the most notorious images from it of a college student uh, from Thomasat University being lynched by a rightist mob. And in some ways, it's such a, a strong icon. I don't know if you know, they were a punk band when I was a kid called the Dead Kennedys that used it for their uh, cover of their, uh, well, ultimately, this was a single and then an album, uh, Holiday in Cambodia, as if the sort of violent images from Cambodia weren't violent enough. Or this image here of a policeman with a cigarette dangling out of his mouth, sort of shooting into a crowd of students. But these images themselves become the images of political violence in 1973 and 76. 1992, uh, they're less iconic images. There were another set of protests against uh, a dictator who overthrew the government in 91, and then in 92 decided he just wasn't going to hold elections uh, and thought, well, I'll just make myself the prime minister. His name was uh, Suchinda Krapayun. And uh, actually, the, the iconic image comes from television here. And once again, the king's involved. Uh, after protests on the street, and the army shooting into the protesters. And this time, they weren't just students. That A lot of them, they were called the cell phone mob, that they were largely middle class, affluent uh, city people who were protesting against this guy here, the general uh, Suchinda, declaring himself prime minister without elections. But the king of Thailand called him in at 9 o'clock at night. And he's the leader of the group of protesters, Jam Long Si Mung. And uh, he more or less said to them, on national television, you're probably wondering why I called you in here tonight. There's some things that we need to talk about. He said, essentially, knock it off. And this image becomes a powerful images, uh, image of the two of them here, kind of on their knees in front of the king. He's wearing a black handkerchief in his pocket to sort of signify the, the mourning for the dead students and the dead protesters. But the present trouble actually begins much uh, more recently. It begins with this guy. Taksin Shinawat, who was the prime minister from 2001 to 2006, Thailand ended, ended up with a much better constitution in terms of democracy starting from 1997, uh, something that gave people more choice in choosing their representatives and ultimately in choosing a prime minister in this constitutional uh, democracy system. The problem was, at least for some people, was that they elected a guy, uh, or I should say a guy came to power who was a billionaire tycoon. And uh, he, was, he had a, his own political party. He originally started off working with an existing party, and they kind of folded into a party that he ran and controlled called Thai Rak Thai, which means Thais who love Thais. And on one hand, he was very, very popular. Uh, he'd, he was a former policeman. He's ethnically Chinese. He comes from a family that's uh, sort of largely uh, what you, you, you call sort of pure Chinese, that they were Chinese immigrants a few generations back who've largely married into other Chinese families. Um, he was from, well, he was born in the North, a policeman. He studied in the United States. He got a PhD in criminal justice in a school in Texas that I, I, I can't now remember. Um, but he made a lot of money and made it for himself through c computer sales and telecommunications and ultimately uh, cell phones or satellite phones and that kind of thing became a very, very powerful media tycoon. Some people compare him to uh, Berlusconi in Italy. His sort of policies were populist, and they were popular with rural voters, that he gave money to villages for them to use uh, in development, that he was given a lot of 
freedom to develop their own programs that they thought would be beneficial. He also had a health uh, scheme or a health reform scheme that would allow anyone to go to the hospital for the equivalent of about a twenty. It was a 30-bot scheme. So whatever ailed you, the hospital was had to take care of you, a government hospital uh, to take care of you. So rural people and poor people generally liked him. He also declared kind of war on drugs. Uh, Thailand, if, if you don't know this, uh, has a problem now with uh, methamphetamines, that it's easy to produce <coughs> these drugs in Southeast Asia. And they've become a, a scourge, in a sense, on society, with farmers taking them when they need to bring in the crops, stay awake for days on end working. Uh, truck drivers will drive the whole length of the country, stay awake for three days. Students themselves take them to cram for exams, to sort of cram a whole semester in a few days of staying awake and reading. But the consequences are, are these. You ultimately have people who snap and go crazy and take hostages and, and flip out. But he declared a war on drugs that initially was somewhat popular. The problem is he kind of gave uh, a quota. You had to sort of find X amount of, of, of drug uh, sellers in the, your, your areas of the country. And supposedly some of the, the targets of these were not necessarily people selling drugs. That was just a way of set, settling vendettas. So they think a lot of people were killed in this war on drugs who weren't really drug sellers. The other thing he was blamed for, and maybe this is not the most profound thing, but it, it, in some ways it's the most serious, uh, was mishandling the southern insurgency that Thailand had what's called a restive south. Uh, the southern part of the country is mostly, or at least there are three provinces that are predominantly Muslim. And, you know, insurgencies have been flaring there for the last few hundred years. And uh, at least in the last couple decades, from the early 90s, things had been calm. But he changed things. He altered the structure. He pulled out the generals that had been working down there, put in his own people and was blamed for antagonizing the South and causing this whole thing to explode into more violence and fighting and massacres and, and retribution. But maybe the last sort of thing that people had against him, I should say he was very popular for a lot of reasons, but his unpopularity had stemmed with his relationship with the king, with King Pumipon. That you, no one really talked about this officially in public, but it was well known that there was antagonism between the two. He resented the king constantly uh, having uh, this kind of uh, sort of moral authority over him, even though he was the prime minister. He felt that the king's speeches were indirect lectures to him. And he wasn't as deferential or as publicly respectful of the king as a lot of people thought he should have been. So a lot of whispers said the king doesn't like him, and he doesn't like the king, and, and he'd rather live without a, uh, uh, a monarchy. And what, what happened is, well, we're going to skip ahead, that there were, well, no, we'll go from here. That there were, when, when Thaksin was the, the prime minister, there were a lot of protests starting from around April 2006. And you see them, he's, he's sort of portrayed as a Hitler figure. He's blamed for being a totalitarian figure. He, he stifled the media. He used the courts to bring lawsuits against people who'd written negative things about him. People felt that uh, he was using his money and <coughs> His, his power to, to bring in uh, uh, a huge coalition of politicians. I mean, essentially, the accusation goes that he bought his, his political rivals, brought them into his coalition, stifled dissent, used the courts. Uh, he controlled a lot of the, they were, most of the TV stations were government stations, except for the one private station that he owned, or at least his family owned. So people felt that uh, the country was veering toward totalitarianism. So, Protests broke out, something that a group calling itself the People's Alliance for Democracy uh, protested. And they called themselves the Yellow Shirts. Yellow because it's largely associated with the king. This is his color um, having to do with uh, uh, royalty. And I'm pretty sure it's the day of the week that he's born, if I remember correctly as well. You have a color for every day of the week that you're born. They paralyzed Bangkok for a while with protests against him, e efforts by Thaksin's government. This is them. They're the yellow shirts, we'll call them, the PAD. They're pro-monarchy. They oppose Thaksin, and they oppose so-called Thaksinomics. People said those 30-bot uh, schemes uh, that would allow people to go to the hospital were bankrupting the health system, driving doctors away, creating havoc that way. These people were largely urban-based. So it's not the rural, rural poor who, who are opposing him. They're largely middle class, upper class, educated. They're also backed by tycoons. They're just different tycoons. They're often his business rivals who, who are behind the PAD. 
and they have support from the Royal Thai Army. Remember I said Thak Sin was a policeman, and in Thailand, uh, you can gain power from support from the police, which are a much more powerful force than you'd imagine, <laughs> much more powerful than as a kind of national political force uh, than they would be, obviously, in our own country. Or you can be backed by the army, and these guys were backed by the Royal Thai Army. This was the leader, Son Di. He was also a, a media tycoon, and many people felt that his motivation behind this, this uh, anti-toxin protest in 2006 were uh, business-related. To solve things, and I'm cutting out a lot of complicated uh, uh, events, they had a coup, 19 September 2006. They largely overthrew Tox, uh, they overthrew Tox in while he was overseas. He was actually in New York uh, for a meeting in the United Nations. Um, they grabbed power, as they often do in Thailand. Rel relatively few units were involved. You see the soldiers here wearing the yellow on their uniforms uh, to say, look, we're loyal to the king. We've overthrown a government that's you know, been endorsed by the king and received their power from the king, but uh, you know, we're supporters of, of, of Pumipon, his majesty, the king. Sonti Bunyaratglin was the general who carried out the coup. He's actually a Muslim and uh, had worked in the south. Um, I'm going to skip this image here. But the... Uh, this is it, you know, and this is often how uh, uh, political events will, will be received in Thailand. It was actually, people stayed indoors for a day. There was a kind of state of emergency, I think, for about 24 hours. But largely it was over. Toxin was overseas. Everybody folded under him. Not any shots fired. People came out to have their photographs taken uh, by the tanks. And this is part of Thai culture. Those of you who've been there know that uh, Thais have a concept called Sanuk. And it sort of means fun or, or enjoyment, that things should always be kind of sanuk, uh, even a coup d'etat. You should go down and have a little fun, get your picture by the tanks. Tourists came down. This is area. They captured the downtown areas first. It's not far from the backpacking areas. And I'll explain the significance of this a little bit later on. Uh, it became a kind of must uh, stop on, on anyone's <coughs> tourist uh, itinerary. You see the German tourist. I'm guessing he's German. I don't know why. I think he's German. <laughs> the Thais themselves came out and made a day, day of it, posing with the soldiers and their weapons with the uh, yellow ribbons on it. And the kids, people are having picnics by it. And what finally happened is they started to use the background as the coup to shoot uh, music videos uh, with, with dancing girls and <laughs> even fashion shoots for magazines. And finally, the, the t Royal Thai Army said, uh, you know, knock it off. Uh, a coup is not a uh, party, not a celebration in that way. Thaksin himself, long negotiations to bring him back to Thailand. Uh, he came back to defend himself in the courts. He said the coup was illegal. He was, he was a legally elected representative of the country, overthrown by the army. And what happened was he went to court, and the, the, the biggest crime was that in selling his company, he put all his money, his, his telecommunications company, which people accused him of running out of the prime minister's office. He was often flying to Burma or India on secret missions, missions he wouldn't disclose to the, to the publicly to the country. And people speculated it had to do with making deals for his uh, telecommunications company that was now in the hands of his wife. And um, when they sold it to a Singaporean company, uh, the government determined they didn't have to pay taxes on the sale. And it was you know this sort of a company that was worth I forget what it was, but it's, it was in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, and determined he didn't have to pay taxes on selling it. So the court actually found his wife, who was in possession of the company, guilty of tax evasion. And they agreed to hold new elections. Toxins out of the picture. His Thai Rock Thai party was dissolved. And they end up forming a new party that's made up of people who are sympathetic to him. And unfortunately for the guys who staged the coup, the pro-toxin party ends up the strongest in these elections, forms a government, and ends up annoying uh, the people who'd carried out the coup. They come out to the street again and say, look, you, you know, whether it's toxin or toxin's proxy, there's still something wrong with this, that uh, these people are perverting democracy. <coughs> and uh, they came out and they surrounded the government house <coughs> November 2008 and uh, tried to shut down the government they slept there. You see, this is yellow shirts. This is kind of a nice thing. Everybody is color coded so we can tell what faction uh, they belong to. They stayed there for days and days. Uh, her shirt here says uh, Rao Jasu, um, 
we're going to defend the king is what they said. They said Toxin's the enemy to the king and he wants the, the king gone. This uh, group that came out to protest them though, people who came out to defend Toxin, uh, we'll call the red shirts, they're pro-Toxin. They are saying that, look, we don't want coups and the military involved in, in our political system. They're calling for expanded democracy. They're against the status quo. I wouldn't say they're anti-monarchy uh, because a lot of the people who support Toxin are supporters of the king, but they're against the Privy Council. That's the, the group of former generals who advise the king, and uh, they're strongest in the north and northeast. They're also ba backed by wealthy tycoons. Many people said that Toxin, who squirreled, supposedly squirreled away millions and millions and millions more, uh, in fact, uh, I think they end up seizing, we'll talk about that in a second, $2.36 billion from him, uh, that he was supposedly paying for this, uh, this UDD movement. And he has strong support from the police. Now, the Privy Council is a former prime minister, or the head of the Privy Council is a former prime minister named Brem. He was supposedly the one who was behind the coup that overthrew Toxin. But because he works for the king, many people felt it was a royalist coup. Many people accused the, the king and his, his men around him of being behind overthrowing Toxin. So you have the yellow shirts who are opposing the government, and now the red shirts come out to oppose the yellow shirts and end up fighting for a while in the streets. Uh, the Thai riot policemen came out to disperse the yellow shirts. Again, it's policemen, not the army. Uh, beat the yellow shirts that kind of thing. <coughs> Some of them are killed uh, uh, by an M79 grenade attack. Um, and the yellow shirts retaliate. They, they can't necessarily paralyze the government, so they seize the airport. In some ways, it's an inspired thing that they shut down the airport. And I forget now how many millions. It's, it's 20, 30 million people, maybe more, uh, visit Thailand as tourists every year. And if they can't land uh, and they can't leave, and the news of the airport being in the hands of protesters spread around the world, uh, it, it's going to end up gumming up the, the national economy and, and causing huge amounts of money to be lost. So they seized the airport, and they couldn't get rid of them. They were there for, for I forget, 10 days, uh, almost two weeks, um, because the police were reluctant to come in and shoot these largely urban, wealthy, slightly older, middle-aged tourists who'd captured the airport. And in the meantime, the prime minister, Samak, who was a uh, uh, sort of right-wing figure himself from the 70s and a kind of toxin proxy, was in, it turned out that the courts decided that he had to resign because he'd uh, accepted money from appearing on a cooking show or something like that at the time, which is an odd <coughs> detail for a prime minister. Um, and then after that, the party he belonged to, which in English and in Thai is, is known as PPP, the uh, People's Power Party was overthrown when the courts determined it was had violated some of the election laws that supposedly had bought votes, and uh, some of the members had been who participated in it should have been banned from uh, the election. So the the courts, in a sense, dissolved the government. This was called the judicial coup of 2008, and uh, they're dissolved. This red shirt bloc is dissolved, and a new government's formed around the Democratic Party that is pro under this guy Abbasid who are pro-yellow shirt. And Abbasid is seen as a kind of weak prime minister because he lacks strong military support, army support, or police support. He's young. I think he's my age. Uh, as you'll see, he's also uh, from a, an ethnically Chinese family. He studied at Oxford. He was not seen as a kind of traditional prime minister who may have been in the army or the police. And uh, this is the uh, official uniform of the government. These are not military uniforms. And um, in the process of a kind of weak prime minister taking over, who has the yellow shirt support, the king goes into the hospital. He went in September 2009. You see, these are people at Sirirat Hospital wishing him well, the elephants and the yellow flags and that kind of thing. Um, but some people felt that the events were related. With the king in the hospital and a weak prime minister, opposite. Uh, goes about trying to dismantle the red shirts, the people who are pro-toxin. He sets up 38 security centers around the north and northeast to crack down on their protests and political activity. He puts 500 Royal Thai Army troops at checkpoints outside of Bangkok to keep them from coming into the capital. He threatens to shut down the red media because they have their own TV stations, that kind of thing. At the same time, uh, the court that found him guilty of tax evasion seizes the money that it had frozen. And the, the amount that the <coughs> courts got their hand on 
2.6, I'm sorry, 2.36 billion U.S. dollars of his assets. And in many ways, that was the last straw, that this incensed a lot of the political supporters of Thaksin and his factions. And starting around March 2010, and the thing I like about Thailand is that a lot of this is sort of guided by the agricultural schedule, that these are people who, uh, it hasn't started raining yet, the new planting season hasn't begun properly, so they're going to be free. Even though the events happen in February, they wait a while, they wait several weeks uh, to get these protests together. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with the uh, being freed up because they're not going to have to plant until late April or so when the rains begin. Largest protest in Thai history, 150,000 is, is, is what they estimate. They crowd the downtown area. They try to shut things down. They march through the city at different checkpoints. Uh, this, these red shirts parade around. And I'll show you, this is a map of Bangkok. This is pretty much old historic Bangkok. And when they have protests, they generally have them around the, the government area, the government buildings, the government monuments. Uh, the King's Palace is not so far away. The old palace is down here. Uh, they kind of descended on the traditional parts of the city where you carry out political protests. They occupied this, this Pan Pha bridge over here. And you'll see they hold a really big rally. Uh, they wanted a million people, but even 150,000 is quite significant. They splash their blood, I'll show you those images if you want to see them, on the government house in symbolic effort to say that, look, these, you know, these people are, are, are murdering us around the countryside. I'm focusing on Bangkok, but there are events happening throughout the country. Uh, they start a round of talks to, with the government to, to end this political deadlock. They demand the dissolve, they de that, that, that uh, opposite dissolve parliament, hold elections sooner instead of later. They can't agree on the time. He says, okay, maybe later in the year we can do something nine months from now or so. Uh, they want something much closer to immediately. They want censorship or so-called censorship from the uh, pro red shirt media. No double standards. I mean, they're arguing, saying that arresting Thaksin uh, for corruption uh, is, is, is absurd. They're saying every Thai leader has been guilty of a lot of the uh, things that he's been guilty of. This is what they call double standards. And they, even though this is not an official demand, a lot of people say, let's bring Thaksin back because he had been uh, sent off into exile. The government says no snap elections. They want to amend the Constitution, which scares a lot of people. It had been quite democratic in 1997, the closest thing that they had to a democratic constitution, so-called People's Constitution is what they called it. Uh, a new one that was formulated in 2006 was less so, and when the government says they want to reformulate the Constitution, that scared a lot of the red shirts. They want, uh, the government demands that they end uh, illegal protests. And they allege that a lot of these protesters are paid dupes. Now, they're probably people who f came from the countryside. As I said, they're largely rural supporters of Toxin. We can look at images of them. I'm sorry. And, uh, and they probably were paid to come in, had their, their transportation costs covered. The ones who marched probably were paid, and the ones who stood on the sidelines were paid. But again, that's not so different than other political activity in Thailand. Um, whoops, there we are. The, the government also calls them terrorists. It portrays them uh, in, in, in language that bothers a lot of them. They don't necessarily, in fact, it really bothers them a lot to be called terrorists. Uh, the government declares a state of emergency. And this is them gathering their blood and mixing it with water and, and throwing it on the, uh, the government uh, house. This is the protesters in some ways. I'll, let me see if we can look at images of them. This is Che Guevara. And this is something that's slightly confusing about the red shirt thing. These guys are not left wing by any means that they're not necessary, I mean, they're pro-democracy, and they're uh, sort of, in some ways, they want less uh, monarchical interference, or at least the less interference from the palace in political affairs. But I, a lot of them will be wearing che, che Guevara shirts just because he's this sort of fearsome-looking Western dude with a beard uh, that you, you know, this is it, he's, he's Che. I mean, they're also wearing shirts with Serpico on it, with uh, Al Pacino, uh, <laughs> because he's a fearsome looking dude with a beard. And, uh, but this is, at times people ask me, are the red shirts communists? And this is another thing the government said, oh, these people are old school communists who have come back. And they're not really uh, uh, communists or, or even uh, socialists or left wing. In fact, I don't know where the red comes from, why they're red shirts. And my guess is, and this is just a guess, it's probably uh, proved to be wrong, but I think it has as much to do with the football club, Manchester United, uh, being the Red Devils, than it does anything else. 
Thai army tries to disperse this protest that are around the government house, and of course the people fire back with whatever weapons they have. This is early April. They surround the RTA. Uh, they send in now the army. Remember, it was the police that beat the yellow shirts up. Now the army uh, is going to be involved. The protesters surround the Royal Thai Army 11th uh, Infantry <coughs> Regiment, where the Prime Minister Abbasit was uh, staying for protection. He's forced to flee. In fact, he sort of circling the city in a helicopter. There are odd M79 gr grenade attacks that are occurring all around the city, usually on the outskirts. Uh, no one actually dies in those, but a lot of people are hurt. Mysterious uh, attacks, uh, people firing grenades. You see a Thai soldier wounded as they're trying to break up these protests. What they managed to do is successfully uh, break them up in the downtown part. Here are shrines built for, for protesters who were killed. They break up the protests, and here's an, again backpackers from nearby Khao San Road, where a lot of the foreign backpackers stay, coming out to watch the crackdown on the protesters. And in some ways, they're, they're successful at the Pan Fa protest. 24 are dead when, as, as they clear them out. One Japanese, uh, five soldiers. Soldiers are, are, are killed by uh, blunt force trauma to the head from rocks and uh, projectiles from slingshots, not from bullets. 800 are injured uh, as they clear it. Now, what the people end up doing, and maybe I'll skip a little of this, is they move the protest. They move it to downtown, to an area away from the government offices, into the shopping districts, especially the shopping districts of the wealthy people and the foreign tourists, the place where most of these people here who are farmers, and uh, a lot of them are farmers or they're people who originate in the rural areas. They're people who came to Bangkok to work in construction or service jobs or to drive motorcycle taxis. In fact, the kind of hardcore unit that will follow through the end of this are guys who drive motorcycles as taxis. And uh, they occupy an area known as uh, Racha Prasong. And let me see if I can find it on the map. So this was the old fashioned uh, area with the government buildings and all that. They shift everything down uh, to around here uh, this, in, in this area. And uh, if you see Siam Square <coughs> and, and uh, Central World Plaza and Gaison Plaza, these are expensive, ritzy shopping malls. Uh, and they end up blocking this. They turn this into a kind of red camp uh, for a while. And the green is the kind of uh, army line that goes around them. And this is what was kind of scary for a lot of people. At least in the early part of the protest, they march around, and it's kind of festive uh, occasion. You see this is outside the Central World Plaza. It used to be called the World Trade Center. Uh, but after September 11, 2001, that had negative connotations. So they changed it to Central World Plaza. And you're going to see. It can't escape its bad karma uh, by the end of this story. But they set up a camp here, and they have public speeches and music. See the Louis Vuitton thing here. You see a lot of children at the uh, protests. Uh, they're demand, you know, they, they, they make their demands and the, their spe speeches and that kind of thing. A lot of people, they set up camps. You see them drying their laundry, that kind of thing. There's a foot here in Thailand. A foot is uh, considered not just I mean, it's the lowest part of the body physically, but also spiritually, it's the lowest part. And to stick your foot up at someone is the equivalent of sticking your middle finger up at them. So these are little noisemakers that they rattle back and forth uh, to kind of antagonize the government. A lot of children at these rallies, uh, her shirt here says uh, surf, it says pride. In a sense, they're making fun of the characterization of themselves as dumb peasants and saying, look, you've, you've written us off as serfs in your kind of feudal system, uh, but we're more than that. Uh, people selling food, getting massages, uh, that kind of thing. And even in this, the government at the time is calling them terrorists and saying they have weapons. And some stage a naked protest where they take off their clothes. There's a guy walking around in his tidy whities here, uh, antagonizing this, this army line that's around them. The leaders here become, uh, again, these are guys are not necessarily, the political leaders are seasoned politicians and businessmen and uh, people who are associated with Taksin. Uh, Arisman here, uh, you see him signing autographs and signing people's shirts. When they came to arrest him, uh, they smuggled him through a hotel and he climbed down, I think it was from the fourth story or something, or the third story, climbed down on a rope uh, and uh, to a, a waiting crowd below and escaped. and. and so very, very uh, popular for it. Some of these guys here, too, in the Thai history class, Bunag is an old family <coughs> in Thailand, originally from Persia, that, uh, ha that, that has advised uh, kings from uh, at least the last 300 years or so. 
But uh, these guys are actually involved with the red shirts as well, and more red shirt leaders type politicians. And I mentioned the Che Guevara. He starts to become a kind of Che image on their red shirts uh, as well. Now, I'm not, I won't go so much into the monks now, because I'm, I'm going to try to wind up soon enough. But uh, I'm going to give a talk later on at the Annapolis Unitarian Universalist Church about um, the role of the Sangha. But they have a lot of support from monks. Many of the monks come from rural areas. Many of the rank and file monks are from poor families, like many of the red shirts who supported Thaksin and opposed Abbasid and his government. Um, you see them here handing out food and that kind of thing. I want to point out that even though they're opposing the yellow shirts, they're not necessarily anti-king. That they, they're, they're very careful not to say anything negative about the royal family. In some ways, they blame the people around the king for uh, overstepping, well, for overstepping their, their power and, and bringing dishonor to the, the palace. Uh, but nobody really carries out any anti-monarchical uh, expression during this period. The, uh, this is roughly what happens. They occupy the shopping district, the order state of emergency, they send in troops to clear them. 25 people are killed uh, in a lot of the initial, well, you'll see, in the, the uh, initial violence. Grenade blasts, uh, policemen shot in clashes throughout northern Bangkok. This goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks. We started with 150,000, but it dwindles after a while. The government is constantly uh, negotiating with them for a ceasefire. And both sides can't come to an agreement. There's a, a roadmap to resolution that they supposedly come to agreement with on May 3rd. But the UDD, that's the red shirts, they start adding <coughs> extra demands, and the government withdraws the offer. They thought they had a deal. Some people think that the red shirts are divided and that one faction had agreed and the other faction wasn't uh, happy with it. What happens is they start building a barricade, and there's been a lot said about the barricades, about local wisdom and building barricades like they build and built them in the pre-modern times. And uh, you know, obviously, they didn't have 18-wheeler uh, tire uh, and that kind of thing. But they said, oh, we studied the defenses of, of the ancient past and used sharpened bamboo sticks. And they start um, fortifying their camps, even as their numbers diminish. And perhaps because their numbers are diminishing, they start to build this kind of midi forts all around Bangkok. Imagine, though, I mean, this is a city of probably some 12 million people. Imagine such a thing of forts being built around New York City and fortified and uh, armed and that kind of thing as time goes on. There's accusations that they're shooting back and forth between them, uh, that, uh, and the red shirts say no, that we're largely peaceful and we don't have weapons, and that they're provocateurs who are shooting from the buildings. And uh, they're accused, the, the, the army, of sending in snipers and shooting at their ranks and that kind of thing. But there's uh, gunfire exchanged all the time. And a lot of central Bangkok is paralyzed. These are actually weapons that they're being forced to turn in. But you see it's things like marbles and rocks and slingshots. And uh, they also have ID cards that are issued specifically to get in and out of those uh, uh, embankments there. A turning point happens with this guy. This is Major General Katia Sawadipon. He is a red shirt sympathizer, a former army uh, uh, commander who was active in the south against the Muslims. He's written a series of, this is him here, he's known as Sedang is his nickname, he wrote a series of books that were uh, kind of popular. They're full of army stories and army adventures, and they're easily read and, and digested. And, and he, become, he, he was, even in his retirement, a kind of uh, best-selling author and, and sort of folk hero. He'd be on TV all the time. But he's a red shirt sympathizer. Even though he's from the army, he likes Thaksin and he liked their movement. He made him, appointed himself uh, like the commander of their defenses and showed them more or less how to uh, build this stuff and to keep people out. You see, he's a celebrity. Everyone wants their picture taken with him and his autograph and that kind of thing. And on 13 May 2010, while he was talking to a New York Times reporter, I mean, talking into a tape recorder, a sniper shot him from a building, and uh, he died a couple days later. This is him being carried out. And uh, this is another turning point, uh, his funeral here, of a realization on both sides that there's not going to be an easy way out. The government says, this is it. We're going to declare this a live fire zone. All protesters, tourists, journalists, anyone entering these camps are going to be shot. Medics are banned from the area to help from the wounded. The government by the 14th has had enough, and maybe the assassination, whoever did it, 
Uh, the government denies assassinating Sedang there. Uh, we don't know who, who, who specifically did it. We see monks leading prayers at these encampments. Uh, I like this because I think these are what they use to uh, protect uh, orchids in orchid farms in Thailand to keep the sun off them. Uh, there's a guy praying at one of these things. They start to burn the camps uh, anytime the, the army comes in. 5,000 now remain out of 150,000, but the 5,000 remain are hardcore, that these are the guys who are motorcycle taxi drivers. In the past, some of these would have been called Nak Leng, that they were kind of village toughs uh, who are now urban toughs. Uh, they burn vehicles that come too close to them. They, I love the M80 sort of thing, a very, very dangerous thing to, to hold on to it, uh, firing it at the police whenever they get close. When they drop leaflets on them from <coughs> helicopters, they fired rockets up at the helicopters, fireworks and that kind of thing. Um, you see they're exhausted, though. By late May, they've been there for weeks. They can get food in and out to them. There are people who are sympathetic to them. But uh, as the army closes in tighter and tighter and more people die, it's just a general sense of exhaustion. RTH troops come in. You see with their shotguns and M16s, uh, people taking cover. They force the UDD leaders to surrender after a lot of shooting back and forth. Uh, protesters still won't come out, the final ones. They order shoot on site uh, orders. They protesters end up setting the buildings on fire. And uh, this is the army coming in to, to sweep them out. Uh, break down their barricades uh, using a, uh, APCs, um, which the Thais call aspirin. APC sounds like aspirin to them. Uh, headaches is, 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 well, another association. I don't know exactly about the colors here. It's not something we do, right, as an army or a military. The first time I saw it, that some of them have uh, pink bands on them. Some of the vehicles are marked uh, in pink colors for, for organization. And maybe this was because they were accusing the protesters <laughs> of having uh, counterfeit army people among them uh, who were shooting and uh, uh, inciting trouble. Um, but yeah, they end up shooting a lot of these red protesters at the very end and carrying them out, arresting the ones that they can arrest and take them away. The, uh, the, the defenses are a mess. Bangkok burns for a while. This is the uh, uh, Zen department store at Central World Plaza. This is that expensive uh, department store they were at. Um, this statue becomes kind of iconic. It was actually made by an Indian artist, not by a Thai artist. And nobody ever particularly liked it. Uh, in fact, a lot of negative things were written about it. But it becomes a kind of symbol of uh, shock and, and horror as these uh, department stores go up. Bangkok burns. Uh, people are actually carried initially into, the wounded are carried into monasteries uh, nearby the shopping malls and uh, cared for there before being taken to hospitals. Uh, 36 killed in this final bit of clashes. Thai army storms the protesters, six more dead. Let's just end with here. The cost is high. Some people say five billion in damage, meaning they lost tourist income, buildings destroyed, uh, military expenditures, uh, the stock market tanking, all this other stuff going on. The image is tarnished, and I can't tell you how important this is to Thailand. I mean, that image is everything to uh, a certain segment of the government. They'll, they often bring uh, journalists to court for damaging the image of Thailand. If someone says something negative about Thailand, and not necessarily negative about the king, just negative about Thailand, uh, you can, uh, they'll try to prosecute you for damaging the image. And all of this damage to the image is far more than negative newspaper articles about Thailand. Political action is escalating. That was, those events I showed you from 1973, 76 that were so traumatic to the country involved a few dozen casualties both times. Uh, and yet you get here weeks of sustained violence, shooting back and forth, M79 grenade attacks. People start to become kind of inured to, to violence and casualties associated with politics. The pro problems remain unsolved. They cleared out their, their red shirts, but there's still no political solution to this. Instead, the conflict has moved to the provinces where a lot of people say, OK, well, if Bangkok itself is now uh, fortified and <coughs> blocked off to us, we're going to carry out political action in the rural areas, especially in the north and northeast. So that's essentially the background to it, what happened, and maybe some things about the future. How about questions? Any questions, please? Is there any international intervention taking place? Not international intervention, but throughout the course of the process, there were a lot of foreign governments, including the United States, uh, that kept uh, 
urging the Thai government to try harder to come up with a solution that would satisfy both sides. And because the Red Shirts themselves are former politicians who had been uh, members of parliament and had been uh, uh, active in Thai politics for a long time, they too had connections with the U.S. Embassy. And uh, I think every time the United States uh, came forward and said, we're willing to play a role in negotiating an end to this, the opposite government uh, uh, brushed them off and said that this is an internal matter and, you know, thanks but no thanks, we can handle it. Uh, but several countries, including the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations that they belong to, kept saying that, well, maybe we should uh, convene some kind of ASEAN intervention and come and end this because it's, it's, it's hurting the economy of the region, not just Bangkok and not just Thailand. So ultimately, there was no foreign intervention, no diplomats, no sort of outside brokers, but several did offer at the time. Go ahead. The population's probably now six, uh, I'm sorry, 60 million uh, throughout Thailand, and the 12 million in Bangkok is probably unofficial. It, it, officially, there might be 8 million, but there are a lot of people who are living there who aren't registered to live there. They're re registered to live in the uh, rural areas in the countryside uh, and are just there part of the year to work on construction sites, part of the year to uh, work on their families' farms and that kind of thing. But I, I should say this. The red shirts were presented in the international media as being rural and poor and pro-democracy, but that itself can be overstated. It's not that the yellow shirts are all wealthy, urban, and uh, pro-monarchy or, or anti-democracy. There's a little bit on both. There are definitely people in the city who are pro-red shirt who uh, themselves feel that the poor people have always been given a raw deal uh, in, in Thai politics. And there are also people who are probably well-to-do and educated who aren't happy with the, the status quo with the monarchy having the power to kind of okay coups or settle political differences. They want to see something that's more akin to a proper constitutional monarchy. Uh, so yeah, that shorthand that I give you about uh, 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 poor being red and, and, and rich being yellow and that kind of thing uh, is, is just a kind of uh, general characterization for both sides. And to tell you the truth, I think it was carried too far in the international media. It's not pro-democracy versus anti-democracy or, or totalitarian sides. Uh, both The problem with this, like a lot of tragedies, are both sides are convinced that they're absolutely right, and the other one is the one that's creating havoc on their society. Uh, so both sides wouldn't back down. You know, one claimed they, they, that you know, the yellows gained power with a coup, and the other one said, okay, when you guys are in power, uh, you just you, know, you robbed the country blind and used it for your own uh, business deals. Both sides have a point, uh, and that's partly why they won't back down. And go ahead. What's the balance of power between the monarch and the prime minister, or even in general? Like when the king opened his gates and told people, come in, yeah. what kept the army from just rolling into the king's territory? I mean, what is the See, this is in some ways the problem, uh, what's going on, that for uh, the start of King Pomi and Pon's reign, uh, he had less power than, say, Queen Elizabeth in the UK. Uh, on paper, he has less power according to their constitution that he assents, has to just rubber stamp whatever it is that elections take place or that the parliament uh, legislates. In reality, though, over the course of his reign, he's become more and more uh, powerful because he's popular. He's seen as sort of being above politics and not supposed to be involved in the kind of filthy day-to-day muckymuck uh, of making laws and, and enforcing laws. He's supposed to be a mortal kind of guiding force. But because he has intervened, I showed you intervened in 73, <coughs> he intervened in 76 and 78 and 92 because he is this kind of force that will come down from the clouds and kind of uh, sort out the different factions, demand that both sides uh, stop fighting. There's a, uh, an argument that politicians rely on that, that they're willing to go to the kind of edge and wait for the king to show up and scold them and uh, that they don't have the mechanisms or the, culture, uh, the political culture to work these problems on their own. And some people say this wouldn't have happened if the king wasn't so sickly and he wasn't in the hospital. He made public statements throughout this period, uh, but a lot of the public statements were, work it out, you know, that you guys are the leaders of the country. And uh, uh, some people, I mean, they still, the shirt that I showed you it refers to him as uh, father, you know, as, well, a lot of the shirts refer him to as kind of the honorable father. And, for a lot of people, he still is this kind of father figure. So on paper, he should really have very little role in the political course of the country. But in reality, 
he's seen as this kind of guiding force and a moral force and a great visionary that everybody uh, turns to to sort out uh, disagreements and to guide the economy. And he's generally popular all around. But there are definitely a lot of people who think, even if they like <laughs> this present king and think he's done some good things for the country, they don't necessarily like the institution of the monarchy and what it potentially can do to democracy in the future. So does that answer it? Uh, OK, go ahead. And we'll I, you know, it's a good question because it's on everybody's mind. He's in his 80s. His health is not good. Um, he's had a very sort of difficult and, and event-filled and at times tragic life. Uh, he was very hardworking up until the recent years. Uh, he's beloved by the people because he's seen, or largely beloved by the people. Uh, most people like him because he was seen as being uncorrupt. He lived relatively simple life. Uh, he traveled simply. He visited the, all the provinces. He set up a lot of uh, uh, experimental agricultural stations looking for ways to improve the lives of common people. He was involved in the military in, in the 60s during the Cold War and the 70s. He was uh, a big s supporter of the military in terms of the war on communism. And he's a Cold War figure. And the fear is that the people coming up after him uh, might not be as, as good of a ruler. So. And because he's in his 80s and his health is not good, there is this kind of feeling that if he were to die, it would throw the country into chaos before this, th these matters are resolved. So you're not supposed to talk about it in public. And maybe I should have blocked the microphone. Uh, but Or you definitely shouldn't talk about it in Thailand. But in the back of everybody's mind is that he's old and is probably not going to live uh, much longer uh, because of his health problems and his age. And the kind of restraining order that he has on chaos uh, is going to be gone. And uh, for better or worse, it can spiral uh, without him being there. Does that answer it? Yes, sir. OK, please. And we'll finish up maybe one more. Go ahead. This is just kind of a comment, Please. <clears throat> No, I, there's actually been a lot written about the color, and people have wondered about it. In some ways, it's very convenient and very nice. I told you I didn't have the answer about why the red shirts were red. I'll probably find out as, as soon as this talk's over and realize I, sh I ha should have the answer. But you know, there were groups that appeared calling themselves the no colors. There was a, a group that came out that called themselves the white shirts that said we're on neither side. Uh, but other people said that they were really just <coughs> yellow shirts dressed in white trying to go the red shirts. The king himself, when he came out of the hospital, wore a pink jacket. Uh, and suddenly, everybody was wearing pink jackets, uh, confusing uh, the color scheme. Were the yellow shirts now to become the pink shirts? Uh, in fact, there was a satirical newspaper called Not the Nation, which lampoons the Bangkok nation. Uh, and the headline was something like, uh, I forget what political figure said, many colors still not claimed. Uh, you know, that there were still several out there that factions could uh, uh, grab. So the color part has definitely been part of it. And I think it's also gotten on people's nerves. Cab drivers said to me uh, when I was there that they were sick of yellow and red, that they stopped, you know, they didn't want to think about those because they asso associate them with intractable political positions. That's why I think the white shirts and those tried to emerge from it but didn't go very far. So yeah, the color is very much on everybody's minds uh, as we're thinking about it. Uh, the reds aren't really red in our red China form of red. And the yellow themselves uh, are not exactly, even though they claim to be pro-monarchy, that Son Di, who's the, um, who the leader of the red shirts, I'm sorry, he's the leader of the yellow shirts. Someone tried to assassinate him. They shot up his uh, car with hundreds of bullets. And uh, he accused people associated with the king as trying to kill him. Uh, so people who ostensibly would have been yellow shirts trying to assassinate, uh, he survived the assassination attempt. Uh, he was wounded, but his some of his bodyguards were killed. 
Um, so a lot of the colors are kind of uh, muddied and in some ways uh, give you a false impression of neat political lines. Maybe on, that's a good, good question to end on then. But thanks for coming on, on uh, nighttime.